So the agenda today uh, will be in three main parts. Um, I want to start by explaining a bit about the technology itself, uh, because it's a uh, pretty um, original technology that we are using at Kailal, the MPFC. And I will make a comparison with another technology, which is more well known, which is diffractive optical elements. Then we will go into uh, the theoretical performance. Uh, when you want to do a top hat, I wanted to start by uh, explaining a lot about uh, beam shaping because it's uh, very useful for all material processes. But at the same time, it's not so well known how to qualify a beam shape and, uh, uh, and uh, its quality and what are the main criteria if you want to have a beam shaping which is efficient for material processing. Then the last part, probably the most interesting, would be uh, about process results. And I will get through different process results that we have had with some partners using beam shaping to improve a lot of different um, processes, laser processes. Let me please start uh, with um, a few words about Kylabs. Kylabs, we are uh, actually a deep tech company, it means that we are actually pushing innovation uh, to the market and trying to uh, create uh, new, uh, new things, technologically speaking. Whatever we are doing is based on MPLC, which stands for multiplane light conversion. So we are actually developing uh, the technology and the products. We are manufacturing them uh, here in uh, Rennes, in the west of France, and we are selling them to universities and to uh, the industry. So uh, all that is patented from the beginning, and we've had actually a lot of different uh, prestigious partners all over the world. This technology can be applied to uh, a lot of different areas. Uh, we have started by uh, doing a lot of telecommunication, we have had uh, our Aruna product line, which is now uh, a few years old, uh, which is dedicated to local network improvement. So for example, the, the campus network, uh, you want to improve it, you can use MPLC. Then we've had the Proteus product line, which is there to improve the network of the future. So mainly we sell that to uh, laboratories which are studying uh, telecommunication and which want to uh, make record. We have, for example, the world record of the highest uh, data rate uh, in a fiber. Uh, the new, uh, the, the latest uh, product line is Tilba. Tilba is there to improve uh, the laser communication. So the idea is to improve the communication in between the ground and the satellite or in between satellites using also our technology. We have our custom product line, which is for the rest of the application, uh, meaning defense application or medical application, for example. We have a customer coming with one specific need and we will develop a specific product for him. But today we are here and we will be focused only on the Canona product line it's our product line which is dedicated to improve laser material processes. So what does that mean exactly? Whenever you have a, a part uh, which is manufactured somewhere uh, and uh, at some step of the process of manufacturing, there is a laser which is used. Uh, we want to improve this process. So it's pretty broad. It can be the manufacturing of a watch. It can be the manufacturing of your TV. It can be the manufacturing of a car. It can be the manufacturing of a plane. You have actually lasers which are used all over, uh, all over the, the world in the industry. And we want to improve either the quality of this process, either the yield of this process using beam shaping. So the application we are targeted are actually divided mainly in two worlds. The world of what we call macro processing, which is uh, based on multi kilowatt uh, CW lasers. So it's a uh, laser which has, are extremely powerful, but uh, which are CW lasers, so continuous wave. And it can be used for laser cutting, welding, additive manufacturing, or composite heating, laser texturing. There are actually a lot of different ways to use it. And uh, some of them are very old. For example, laser welding was one of the very first application of the laser uh, more than 30 years ago. And some which are actually uh, very new, uh, such as additive manufacturing, which is still developing, or laser texturing. And this can actually be applied to a lot of different industries, like automotive or aerospace. So now we can say actually that we have worked on all these applications in K-Labs, and uh, we're pretty proud of saying that because, well, it was tough to address all the application. Then there is a world of microprocessing, which is uh, uh, at a smaller scale, of course, but it's also using different lasers. Uh, it's mainly using pulse laser. Uh, we say ultra short pulse, but it can be uh, femtosecond, it can also be picosecond or nanosecond laser. And the idea is to address different processes, such as engraving, cutting at a very small scale, drilling. Uh, again, at a very small scale, we can drill um, parts which are like 100 micron, for example. Welding, but welding, uh, again, at a different scale compared to uh, weld, for example, a car door. It's at a very small scale. We will get back to that at the end. Surface texturing or thin film removal. And again, this can be applied to a lot of different industries. The most popular one are probably uh, the medical devices, the watch industry, the automotive, glass industry, and a huge one is actually the electronic industry. 
in order to address uh, these two different worlds, we have developed different products. And, uh, and, and that's going to be my last slide about Kai Labs. Uh, we have developed Canada Pulse, Axican, and Split, which are the one at the bottom of the image. And these ones are actually used uh, for microprocesses improvement. And we have the one at the back, the very big one, which is Canada HP. And this one is actually used for high power processes. So when we will be uh, looking at the process results, we will try to uh, see some process with results with each of these different products. So I will get into the details later on. Okay, so let's start now by uh, the theoretical part about uh, different technologies. And of course, I will start by uh, talking about multiplane light conversion. The idea uh, of uh, this first part of my discussion is to say that there are a lot of different ways to actually shape the light. And uh, depending on what uh, way you choose, you will have very different results and you will have very different behavior of your beams. Let's say, for example, that we have this uh, very strange, but uh, anyway, it's an example, uh, arrangement of photons uh, in an intensity plane, and you want to make a top hat. So you want to have an equal energy over the whole uh, width of the beam. You could just squeeze it a little bit, and you will have it, uh, the image on the, on, on, the, um, on the left, where the photons on the left are still on the left, and the photons on the right are still on the right. You could also choose to take all the energy, which is in the middle, and spread it all over the beams, and then you will have, again, a top hat with all the energy equivalent uh, uh, over the whole width of the beams. You could also choose to do something a little bit strange, take all the patterns which are on the left and spread them on the right, and at the end, we'll again have a top hat. At last, even if the patterns are arranged in the same way uh, from the image, uh, the, 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 the graphic on the left and the graphic on the right, they could have different direction, meaning that the patterns are there, they are making this top hat, but they are not going in the same direction. It is pretty clear when you see that, that you will see the same thing. In each case, you will have a top hat, but it is not the same thing, and it will not behave the same way. And that's the whole point about beam shaping. Basically, there are three ways. Uh, it's, uh, there are more ways than that, but uh, we will focus on the three main technologies or the three um, uh, main ways to generate a top hat in this first part. Uh, the, the most classical one that you have probably all already uh, studied uh, uh, at the university or in the engineering school is ray tracing. You will use something like ZMAX or Oslo or whatever, uh, classical software uh, which are doing ray propagation. So you will have lenses or mirrors and you will just tr trace rays one by one until you have something which is homogeneous uh, over uh, the plane where you are having the top hat. This is, for example, what you do when you do um, 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 systems like microscope objective or cameras objective that you are using, you're using ray tracing. This is also uh, basi based on the law or the Fresnel laws, so very basic laws. Then you could be doing uh, diffraction, so you are using different laws of subjects. You are using the law of the diffraction, so you are doing uh, wave optics, and this is uh, what you do when you uh, uh, want to have a diffractive optical element. And it is uh, really uh, uh, the light is really tuned using different physical laws, so you will get very different top hat. At the end, the last way uh, that we will discuss is uh, using modes. So again, you are using another law of optics, the law of mode propagation. So you have a laser input. Uh, its energy is spread over different modes, and you will propagate the modes one by one in order to shape it using now uh, what we are calling the multiplane light conversion. So our technology, which is based on this very specific law uh, of uh, light propagation. So how does uh, multiplane light conversion uh, works? Uh, well, actually, the idea is that you have a succession of face plates, as, as you can see on uh, the bottom left uh, image. So you have one face plate after the other, which is tuning the light. And in between the different face plates, you will have, it's very important, free space propagation. The idea is that in between each face plate, you will have enough space to make an optical Fourier transformation of the beam in order to have a proper propagation and have a proper MPFC. Uh, in the past, at the very beginning, we were using a uh, um, linear uh, way to do it, as it's shown on the image on the left, with different face plate one after the other. Ends up that it's not very um, smart to do it this way, so we have decided to implement it in a reflective way. That's what you can see on the image on the right. So you have a cavity, uh, you have a textured mirror on one side, and in front of it, you have just a very standard mirror. The light is going back and forward, the, tex the textured mirror and the standard mirror, 
and uh, the textured mirror is having one face plate after the other, one right to the uh, one right to the other. So it's uh, fully reflective, which is very useful for a lot of things that we'll see uh, in the next slides. And the idea is also that it's much more uh, compact compared to the image on the left. Now, uh, a little bit more about MPLC. The idea is that you want to do unitary spatial transformation. What does that mean exactly? It means that uh, we will consider that we will have some number of modes at the input, let's say six, why not 12, and we will transform them into an, a, a, a number of modes which is similar, so six or 12 modes, whatever, n modes at the input, n modes at the output. And what we do is that we have the energy going from one mode to the other mode, and this way, by choosing the right mode at the input and at the output, we will really shape the light the way we want. It's pretty important to understand that because um, at the end, um, this mode way of thinking is actually the very basic uh, of uh, MPLC, and that's uh, how you can understand its performance uh, in material processing. Why is that? I will start by uh, by zooming on a very specific feature that we have um, that we have at uh, K Labs, which is called uh, mode cleaning. The idea is uh, to have um, a feature which is used to stabilize the laser. We will get back to that also again uh, uh, later in the presentation. But when you are using femtosecond laser, for example, they are not very stable because it's very complex to manufacture a femtosecond laser. So the beam is always showing some tilt, some shift, some defocus. Ellipticity, astigmatism, whatever. And uh, it is absolutely impossible to have a very nice shaping if your input is not stabilized. This is the same whatever technology you are using. It can be DOE, MPLC, or uh, standard, um, standard uh, beam shapers. In any cases, if your beam is not stable, the output will not be stable and you will have a distorted beam. So we thought, okay, we have to start, if we want to do a proper um, beam shaping, we have to start by stabilizing the beam. And we will do that using the core technology of MPLC based on modes. So when at the injection, we see that beam which is tilted at Kai Labs, what we see is that uh, we have energy which is still in the main mode, the TEM00 mode, so the Gaussian mode. And whatever is not centered is actually energy which is in the higher order modes. So for example, it's in the modes uh, with um, uh, energy at the side. And what we will do is that we will select the energy which is still in the main mode, the, the one uh, uh, of the stable initial beam. And this energy, which is in the main mode, will follow a specific path in the MPLC and will get out of the, of the MPLC, can be shaped or not shaped actually, but anyway, uh, it will go to the material and at the end it will be stable because only the energy which is inside the main TM000 will um, actually get through the MPLC. On the other side, the energy which is in the higher order modes will follow another path in the MPLC. So uh, whatever is instable will uh, somehow end up somewhere else in the space and will be today uh, just blocked uh, so that it's not perturbated, uh, perturbating uh, the, the output. And uh, it could be also monitored if you want to see how much energy you're losing in order to characterize how unstable your laser actually is. So this unique feature, which is called mode cleaning, is extremely important when you want to do beam shaping with femtosecond laser, for example. And uh, what you have understood probably now is that uh, this has a cost. Uh, we are having a very stable and very nice shaping, but this is costing us energy because whatever is not stable, not useful, is at the end blocked. So uh, it's very interesting also to see uh, the transmission of such a system. And we will get back to that when we will be looking at the performance of uh, uh, topa generation. Okay, so now I will be uh, switching to um, diffractive optical elements. So it's probably the the biggest competitor that we have uh, when we want to do beam shaping uh, for uh, laser material processing. So it's good to have a stop on the technology or so and to see how it's working. Uh, we will have to start by something. I will be very short on that because I don't want to be very theoretical today. But the idea is that uh, uh, it's a must to understand Fourier transformation, otherwise you will be lost in the rest of the presentation. So I believe that uh, most of you have already heard about Fourier transformation but I will be explaining very shortly uh, how we use it when we do beam shaping. The idea is when you have a signal, or it can be actually um, uh, an image, um, it's made of special frequencies, of course. If it's something which is moving very fast, you have high frequencies. If it's something very smooth, which is moving very slowly, it's having lower frequencies. When you want to do, for example, uh, uh, a topat, 
you will have sharp edges. So the light is going from uh, no light to maximum light very quickly, very uh, in a very small uh, special uh, space. It means that you have a higher frequency inside that beam. So it's always important to understand that uh, depending on the, the shape, you will have different frequency inside it and you can uh, know what frequency you have by doing the Fourier transformation. What is very uh, useful is that it's very easy to do uh, when you're doing optics. You can do that just using a lens. So when you have a lens, you have in uh, the, the Im uh, object plane, you have the image. In the image plane, you have the Fourier transformation. So this will be used actually uh, all over the presentation when you want to understand what we are doing uh, with DOEs and with MPLCs. For DOE, what is DOE, diffractive optical element? So when I was preparing the presentation, I realized that be behind the word uh, DOE, there are a lot of things actually which are hidden. Uh, you have uh, things which are working very differently at the end. Uh, you have homogenizer, which are someone somehow called uh, uh, DOEs, but let's not talk about that today. You have also Fresnel lenses, which are also sometimes uh, hidden behind the word DOE. But again, this is probably misusing of the word. And we will be really focused on uh, what is um, uh, done uh, based on diffraction. So it's uh, a plate, generally it's a glass plate, which is having a thin microstructure uh, over, over, over it. Uh, and this microstructure is in the order of magnitude of the wavelength. It's very important to, uh, uh, to understand that. And that's how it's making diffraction, actually, and it's making the shaping. Because, of course, you are doing that at a microscale on, uh, on the glass plate, you are altering the phase. It's very important, again, for the future. So because you are slowing down the beams at some part, you are accelerating it at some other, I mean, relatively to, to, to the input beam. And that's how you, at the end, tune the light in order to make the shape that you want to do. Most of the time, this is done using uh, two, pay, two pi uh, phase jumps. Why that? Because you want to have a structure which is not too big, otherwise it's complex to engrave it uh, on the DOE. So you will, you will use a uh, two-pi phase jump. And then again, this is uh, a drawback. And this is the reason why uh, you have some uh, huge drawbacks of GOEs, which are actually um, um, diffraction into multiple orders. So what it means, it means uh, that you will have the main image uh, going uh, straight through the DOE. And you will have the plus one, minus one, et cetera, uh, orders, which are also having some energy uh, because of uh, this way to uh, manufacture the DOE. So most of the time, uh, DOEs are uh, actually not generating directly uh, the shape that you want to have. They will be generating the free transform uh, of uh, this um, shape. And you will have to use uh, one more lens right after the DOE in order to make the free trans transformation and to get the right topaz. So this is about the theory. So it was not very long because, uh, well, it's uh, an introduction. And we will now try to focus on the performance uh, of a topaz. Why I want to discuss that is because um, at Kylabs we have realized now for some years that uh, shaping is very useful to improve the industry uh, uh, processes. But most of the time, uh, the, the whole optical community and the whole process community uh, is not so familiar uh, with what is actually a good top hat or a bad top hat or whatever shape actually, but anyway, a good beam shaping and a bad beam shaping. And it's very interesting to spend some time thinking about what are the criteria if you want to compare different uh, topaz, and if you want to understand, uh, will that shape work for my process? Because different shapes are needed for different processes. So we will be uh, discussing a few different uh, topics, uh, some more in detail than other. The compatibility with the industrial setup, it's a must, but it's something very complex, actually. The shaping quality, uh, this is, uh, uh, it, it, it may sound simple, but at the end, it's not simple at all. The depth of field, it's something very important as well. The transmission of the system, I will be short on that, and the robustness to instabilities because it's also very important. So let's start by the compatibility with the industrial setup. What does that mean exactly, being compatible with an industrial setup? It means that doing beam shaping somehow is not very complicated. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do that. It's done for decades now. But having a, a, a beam shaper which is compatible with the actual industrial setup that you're using when you are manufacturing a watch or when you are actually repairing the cell phone, the, the screen cell phone uh, back in China, or when you are doing the door welding of your car all over the world, is much more complex than doing it in the lab. Why that? You have, first of all, to be compatible with a machine. Uh, this is very complex because if you want to do a, a beam shaping, which is of uh, easy size, uh, let's say, for example, uh, doing a shaping of five millimeter 
with uh, uh, a femtosecond laser is not complicated, but it's not useful either. So you have to make very small outputs in order to be useful to the process and in order not to have multiple telescopes in order to get from five millimeter to, for example, five micrometer. So this is very uh, complex. We want to have something which is compact because you are integrated inside a machine. For example, when you are doing additive manufacturing, you have a very small space in order to do the beam shaping and you have to handle high power. So you want to have big optics in order to handle the high power, but at the same time, you have to have something which is very compact, something like maybe a shoebox. So it's a huge challenge. We want to be compatible with the laser, of course. So uh, actually you are paying actually uh, pretty, uh, a pretty expensive price for each watt of a femtosecond laser. You don't want to waste it. So you want to keep the, the femtosecond um, first duration. So this is very complex whenever you are, it's because uh, when you are having such a short um, pulse, you have a very broad spectrum. And whenever you are going through any kind of glass, you are damaging this spectrum. So it's very important to, to really focus on preserving the pulse duration for pulse laser. We want to handle the laser instabilities. As I did say, having a, a nice shaping is not that complex, but what do you want exactly? You want to have a nice shaping over time. You don't want to realign your system all the time. You don't want to have uh, something which is uh, working only when you align it, but it's uh, working over hours, days, and weeks. So this is very complex. Again, uh, you have to uh, focus on the environment and the scanner and the FTTR. There are a lot of uh, beam shaping technology which are definitely not compatible with going through a scanner and an FTTR. Why that? Uh, when you are based on diffraction, for example, um, because different wavelengths somehow are not exactly having um, uh, the same path through the DOE. When you are going through the FTT lens, where you have a very different quantity of glass to get through, depending on where you are hitting the FTT lens, in the middle or in the edge, you will really damage a lot of the shaping itself. What does that mean? It means that you will have a very nice shape in the center of the field of view, FOV, and you will have a distorted output in the edge of the field of view. So it's a very big challenge to preserve the shape over the whole field of view and actually not to crop. Uh, as I did say, it's very complex to understand uh, um, how to get through this system. One very easy way to uh, understand that is that you will have, a, I will get back to the Fourier transformation. As I did say, it's going to be useful over the whole presentation. When you are having a top hat in your processing plane, you have an FT talent just before it. Behind the FT talent, you have the Fourier transformation of the top hat. Because it's something which is sharp, uh, the spectrum is pretty broad, and the Fourier transformation is pretty big. So it's very complex not to crop the Fourier transformation. And if you do crop the Fourier transformation of your top at beam, then you will have uh, the, the shaping which is damaged, and you will have, for example, oscillation over the beam. So we will be comparing the performance uh, of two systems, uh, an MPLC system and a DOE system, just to make you familiar with the different criteria that we have uh, for um, for uh, beam shaping. So the, this is a setup that we'll be using with uh, the, um, the MPLC, it's based on the Canon Dappers. We are having a beam expander to uh, squeeze the beam to the right size. And this is uh, what we will be using with the DOE. So you have the DOE plus a lens to make the free transformation. And we will get to that later on, but it's important to compare shapes with the same size. So we have another telescope to make it having the same size as the MPLC output. Beam shaping quality. So let me check on that a little bit. So uh, um, when you want to compare um, quality of different beam shaping, it's very complex because there are not so uh, good criteria, and most of the criteria are very complex to understand. At Kailas, we have decided to make this comparison using the shape efficiency. Shape efficiency is actually uh, very complex to understand. The idea is to, uh, uh, to see what energy is really useful to your process compared to the whole energy that you have inside your beam. Most of the time when you are doing processing, you will have a threshold above which you have the, your process which is done. So whatever energy is higher than the threshold somehow is useless. Why that? Because you could be at the threshold. So whatever more is too much. And whenever you have be below the threshold, it's useless too because your process is not being made. On the other side, you want your process to be done on a specific area. It can be, for example, a rectangle. And the idea is that we, we will uh, consider that the useful is energy is the energy which is at the threshold over uh, uh, an ideal 3D shape, which is uh, the shape that we were targeting. It's a very complex criteria. Uh, if you have questions about that, uh, please ask them at the end of the presentation. Uh, but it's somehow very useful, at least, to understand that 
uh, we will compare how much energy is really useful compared to the total energy. Then some uh, criteria, which is very standard also, uh, um, uh, that you have probably heard about uh, maybe already, but not so easy to understand is the plateau uniformity. Here you have an example from the ISO standard actually uh, uh, for different top hat shape. Uh, some, some of them are very smooth and some of them have, are having a lot of oscillation. And the idea is uh, what is actually uh, the plateau uniformity of the different beams. There are two things to uh, understand first is that plateau uniformity is between zero and one all the time and the closer to zero the better. So if you remember that for the rest of the, pressure, you are, the presentation, you're good already. The idea is to see uh, how far from uh, the targeted uh, the energy you are. So you are targeting to be at, for example, an energy of uh, one, let's say, uh, in whatever unit. And uh, the, uh, if your oscillation are very big compared to one, you will have something which is uh, closer to one. If your oscillation are very close to your targeted energy, you will have something which is close to zero. So the idea is that you will divide the oscillation, um, the oscillation uh, amplitude compared to the targeted energy, and it's done uh, using histogram. Um, because it's uh, it's a good way. So you are sampling your beam and you are uh, looking at the energy um, repartition over the whole top hat. At least it's very important also to compare comparing uh, comparable things. So uh, we want to compare things with uh, equivalent sharpness. So what is the sharpness? We will be using a criteria which is called the T over L. So T is the transition uh, length. So the, the, the length of the beam, which is going from the threshold to 15% of the threshold, compared to the length of the beam, which is uh, whatever dimension we have, which is at the threshold. So let's get now to uh, some shape that we have done at Kylab. So we, we, this is based on MPLC technology, and I will be short on that. You, we, it is uh, what we call actually a pretty sharp shape. The T over L is 0.1. So the transition is 10 times smaller than the length of the beam. We are having a very good efficiency of 58%. Maybe it's not so easy to um, understand that 58% is very big. It is actually a very complex metric, the, the efficiency, and 58 is pretty good. Plateau uniformity is 0.13, so it's also pretty good. This is another shape that we have. Uh, we want to say that we are doing squares, but we are also doing uh, round. And in this case, it is a smoother shape. The T over L is 0.2, so the transition is five, five times smaller than the length of the beam. And the shape efficiency is already 50%, which is pretty big. Uniformity is actually very good. And this is what you get with the standard DOE. So uh, this is a DOE that you can buy uh, from a very uh, well-known DOE manufacturer. And we are having actually something of the sharpness equivalent to the smooth one, 0 0.24. And the shape efficiency is actually only 22% with a plateau uniformity of 0 0.42. So now that we have discussed the shaping quality uh, with very important criteria, I want to discuss the depth of field. Uh, when I discuss about depth of field, I generally start by saying, what is depth of field? I guess that everybody uh, believes that they understand depth of field, but at the end, it's very complex uh, depth of field. Basically, uh, when you're talking about Gaussian beams, which most of you are probably uh, using uh, generally, um, the depth of field depends on three things, the dimension of the beam, because you have a law uh, which is linking the waste of the beam to, the, um, to, the, to uh, its depth of field and to its uh, spreading. Uh, it depends also on the beam sharpness and it also depends on the technology to be used. So this is what we will be discussing in the next slide, the technology part. But the idea is that uh, you have to compare things with the same dimension and same sharpness. Most of, uh, most of you probably know the Rayleigh range, uh, so it's a way to characterize the depth of field of a Gaussian beam. It's where the size of the beam is uh, square of a square two uh, of the initial waist. So you want to compare, uh, may, may, maybe, uh, many people want to do it. They want to compare the depth of field of a top hat compared to a Gaussian beam. But what criteria do you take? Let's get to ver something very basic, the dimension of the beam. What dimension will you say is the same dimension from the Gaussian to the top hat? Uh, will you take uh, the dimension measured at 90% of the maximum? Will you take dimension measured at half of the maximum? Will you take dimension at maybe 1 over e square of the maximum? What you can see here in red, you have a Gaussian. In blue, you have different top hat. It's that it's very different dimension at the end. So which top hat will you say is comparable with the Gaussian? 
actually none of them has really sense. Uh, I just want to say that because when we will be talking in really range, it's not that relevant. It's just a way to compare different things. But at the end, there is nothing to compare in between a Gaussian and a topat when we are talking about depths of field. The truth is that when you are studying the laws of optics, what would be comparable is to have things with the same sharpness. When you have a, an equivalent sharpness, well, you have the uh, something, uh, a transition over, let's say, 50 microns, for example, you are using the same special frequency as the Gaussian beam with the same sharpness as well. And then it's the same challenge somehow to propagate it and to uh, also compare uh, then the, um, the depth of field of the beam. When we will be doing the comparison, because it's very difficult to have criteria when we are doing that, so we will be talking in percentage of, uh, of the relative range. Why that? Because when we want to compare top hat, it is still relevant. It's just uh, not that relevant to compare it with Gaussian. We will be looking at visual profiles because it's always good to see the beams. And we will be using, again, the criteria of shaping quality, the shape efficiency, and the plateau uniformity. I wanted to make a stop on that because it is something extremely important. And when I saw the graph, uh, this graph for the first time, I found it very, very interesting. The idea is to see when you are defocusing two different beams, uh, how the shape quality will degrade. The, the orange curve is a very sharp beam. It's uh, a transition length of 10%, whereas the blue curve is a transition length of 30%. What you will see is that when you have something more smooth, of course, you will waste uh, more energy in the wings of the beam. So the, the maximum shape efficiency will be lower compared to something very sharp. On the other side, the sharp beam, the quality will degrade much faster. So you will have a, a lower depth of field. Why that? If you have higher frequency in, in your beam, it's like if you were having uh, um, uh, something which will spread faster because it's also faster frequency and the depth of field will be smaller. So sharp shapes will degrade faster than smooth shapes. This is something that you have to remember. Uh, so this is the depth of field that we are having with uh, one of our system. What you can see here, it's the so-called sharp uh, square. So it's supposed to have a smaller depth of field, but still when we are the real, at the real range over 20 or the real range over 10, we are still having a very nice shape. This is what you get with a DOE, and uh, it's supposed to have actually a, a depth of field of 0 0.6 uh, times the real range. The truth is that when, you, when we are uh, uh, um, scanning over the depth of field, uh, when we are just reaching uh, a 10 uh, millimeter after the best focus, we see that the shape is actually very much degraded and the depth of field is way lower than that, probably only 5% of the real range. In order to compare things, uh, uh, using the same criteria to compare apple to apple and the range to a range. Uh, this is at the very range over 20 and the very range over 10. And what you see is that you have really degraded your shape uh, a, a lot and you are not able to have the same uh, shape efficiency and plateau uniformity uh, you can see uh, at those uh, distances. So one stop on that. Uh, this uh, topat was supposed to be smoother compared to the MPLC topat. Smoother is supposed to have a longer depth of field and it is actually having a shorter one. So what does that mean is that we have proved that uh, with the MPLC technology for the same beam, same dimension, same sharpness, we are having a way bigger depth of field compared to DOEs. Because time is actually flying and will be very short on the transmission. Just want to say that uh, the DOE is having generally a transmission around 90%. Uh, why that? Because you have energy in the higher orders. You can see them a little bit on this image, the energy in the higher orders. Whereas in our case, we don't lose energy in the higher orders, but we lose energy in the modeling, so the stabilization of the beam. Uh, we have 92% when we are having uh, some low power, high quality source. With actual film, the second laser, we will be having 80 to 90%. Robustness to instabilities. When we want to compare, um, uh, to compare top hat, also we have to understand that uh, uh, it's very important to have something which is stable, otherwise uh, your process will not be stable. So typical instabilities to be considered is maybe 10% of the waste and 10% of tilt, and we will be focused on these two criteria very easy, even if there are other criteria as well for instabilities. This is some theoretical um, uh, simulation that we are having, uh, uh, mentioning how much energy we will lose with the mod cleaning feature when we are uh, having unstable beams. 
So when we are having a tilt of 10% of the divergence of the beam, we only lose 2% of the energy. Uh, this is pretty similar when we are having a horizontal shift, when we are having a beam waist, so it means that it's uh, the beam waist which is smaller or bigger, or when we are having a beam waist position which is changing, so you are having your waist at a position, but it's actually moving uh, its position. In any case, uh, what we want to say here is that the, the loss uh, in transmission is not very big uh, when we are using the mode cleaning. So this is what you have in terms of shaping when you are uh, moving um, at half of the weight. So half of the weight is huge. And what we can see here is that we are still having a very high quality of shaping when we are moving the beam of half of the waist. This is on the tilt, so when we are tilting on half of the divergent, which is again very huge compared to the actual instabilities of laser, still we are preserving the shape with a very high quality. Now uh, we will discuss uh, DOEs, and uh, we will be uh, pretty short on that, but I think it's very obvious when you look at that. Here at the maximum, we are only moving of 20% of the waste, and you see that this is no more autopath at all. The energy is uh, definitely uh, shifted, and it is not uh, homogeneous uh, anymore. So the shape quality is actually not preserved, and um, uh, the sharpness and the shape efficiency are decreased uh, uh, at very, with a very small uh, shift of the beam. There are no displacement uh, because of the way this is done. And when you are doing some uh, tilt, on the other way, uh, the beam is actually uh, displaced, uh, but the shape is more or less preserved. Uh, the truth is that um, when we are doing this experiment, we were having the pivotal point of the whole experiment on the DOE. It means that we have only shift on the DOE with no tilt, or only tilt on the DOE with no shift. In the real world, you never know where is the pivotal point of your laser instabilities. What does that mean? It means that all the time you will have, at the same time, shift and tilt, and you will have your beam which will be displaced and the quality will be degraded. So that's it. I hope that I have been clear on uh, on uh, what are the criteria when you want to uh, qualify some uh, shaping and what are the important criteria if you want to have a shaping which is really uh, robust for the process. So now we will be uh, discussing some process results uh, using MPLC. Uh, unfortunately, I, I thought that I would uh, be shorter on the first part, so I will have to uh, be uh, a bit quick on that, but still, uh, we have still some time to discuss uh, six different uh, process results. Uh, laser beam welding, so high power uh, uh, beam shaping, uh, automated fiber placement, this is also with uh, high power lasers, glass cutting, uh, microchip welding, surface texturing, and thin film removal, which are all with uh, ultra short pulse lasers. So laser beam welding, these results were obtained with the Institut Maupertuis, so it's a French in uh, innovation, uh, French uh, uh, institute, which is um, developing uh, 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 process results and a new process, innovative process for laser beam welding and, and other actually. The idea is that we will be using this laser head. Uh, it's made of uh, an LKD connector. Uh, the first mirror is a collimating mirror. Then we have three shaping mirrors. And uh, we have now at the end a focusing mirror, which is uh, plus an optical window to protect the system. And we have the targeted shape at the end of the system. Uh, we were uh, generating a ring. I, I, I tried to take some time to explain why uh, we use one shape for one process, because it's very important. The idea is that you have uh, your uh, keyhole. The keyhole is where your uh, material is melted and where you will be doing actually your weld. Uh, that are sometimes unstable, and that is a limitation of the process. When you are having a ring of that dimension, 600 micrometer inner diameter, one millimeter outer diameter, you try to encircle the, um, the keyhole to stabilize it, and it's actually working very well. The idea is that you will follow the keyhole with your uh, ring, and you will stabilize it inside inside the ring. So we are having a very high quality, and one stop on, on the, the image on the right, this is something really unique, but we don't have time to, to discuss it in detail. Uh, focus shift, uh, when you are doing uh, whatever process using a multi-kilowatt uh, laser, of course, all the optics are heating up, and what it means is that uh, the focus plane will move actually quite a lot, can be centimeters uh, during your process. In our case, because we are using only uh, mirrors, or it's a fully reflective system, we have removed uh, the focus shift. So uh, we have made it uh, smaller than one millimeter, which is extremely small, and the processes are much more robust. 
I will try at least uh, to uh, mention some, uh, of course, uh, actual process results. So we were doing some stainless steel uh, welding uh, in this configuration. So what we got with our system is uh, the weld on the top. So we were having energy only on this very uh, ring. It's uh, the calendar product. And as you can see, we have a very nice weld. And this is a macrograph of the weld with a very large uh, also, uh, uh, weld which means that it's very uh, stable, very robust, and it's also very smooth. Uh, this is what you got with the classical spots. So you can see that uh, this is actually way smaller, four millimeter instead of five millimeters, and you have a bit more spatters. We were curious also to compare our uh, results with other technologies. So the most uh, used technology to do beam shaping for welding is a double core fiber laser. So it's a specific laser with uh, a delivery fiber, which is made of two different cores, and you can have energy inside the main uh, core or inside the ring core outside of it. And what uh, was maybe not that obvious is that when you have having energy only inside the ring mode of this laser, you definitely don't have the same quality compared to our systems. You have a lot of spatters. Your keyhole is actually not symmetric and way smaller. So this is what we can bring uh, with MPHC to uh, laser welding. Automated fiber placement, very different application. So we were doing that with uh, Coriolis. Uh, it's actually a, a machine manufacturer, which are based in, uh, in uh, Brittany, west of France. So uh, fiber placement is a composite fiber that you will place on a mold to make some parts. So you heat it up so that it's taking the shape of the mold. And it's mainly used for planes. Uh, there are a lot of parts inside a plane now that are made of composite fiber because it's lighter and it's uh, having still very good mechanical uh, properties. So what we want to do is that we want to improve this process uh, with our um, uh, system. There are two main ways to heat up this uh, composite fiber uh, on the mold. It's either using IR lamps or either using lasers. When you are using laser, you are reaching higher temperature and it means that you can use different composite fiber uh, some of them being uh, more uh, having better mechanical properties. When you are doing this heating up of the fiber, you want to uh, heat only the fiber. So you want to have sharp edges of your uh, beam because you don't want to heat up the machine, which is uh, outside of the fiber. And you don't want to heat up the composite fiber, which is uh, just next to the one that you are heating. So you have uh, composite fiber, composite fiber, composite fiber, and you want to heat up only the one that you are depositing. So you want to have a top hat so that it's having sharp edges in order not to have energy outside of it. And you want it to be very homogeneous because you want your whole composite fiber to be heating up, heat, heated up the same way. Because if the heating is homogeneous, the mechanical properties will be way better. So in this case, we are using high power laser and we are doing a very nice uh, rectangular shape. So the system is just there with an LLKD connector, uh, two MPLC shaping mirrors only, and an optical window. It's extremely small. It's just like this size, I guess. I'm not, I don't know if you saw, see me well on the camera, but it's extremely small system. I will be short on that, uh, but uh, this is what we have in terms of shaping. We couldn't uh, scan through the whole lens of the rectangle because the camera were too small compared to the size of the beam. So we do a scanning uh, over the lens. And uh, on the width, uh, we have a scanning uh, of uh, of the shape profile. It's extremely homogeneous. It's actually pretty sharp. And we have a huge depth of field, which is very useful to have a robust process. Now let's get to the process results. Uh, there were two main aspects that we want to address with our system. Uh, Coilist is actually well known uh, worldly for having extremely compact uh, machines. And if the machine is very compact, you can um, uh, heat up. Uh, very concave uh, parts. So you have your mold, which will be very concave. So the idea of our system was to be extremely small. That's why uh, that's why I was saying that it was extremely small. Uh, and uh, we managed to be really very well uh, integrated inside the machine and to give them this uh, advantage on the market. On the other side, uh, thanks to the very high quality of the shipping, we were having a very uniform heating and the adhesion and the cohesion of the composite fiber was improved a lot. So you can see just there, it's uh, uh, an R&D uh, setup. So it's not an actual part for a plane. It's just on a plano uh, surface. But they are actually uh, uh, doing the, the, the deposition of the composite fiber. 
So uh, now let's go to uh, glass cutting. Uh, we have done a lot of glass cutting with different partners, but I will focus on the results that we have had with the laser centrum of Hanover in uh, Germany. The idea now is to talk about um, uh, microprocessing. So it's based on a uh, pulse laser, and the idea is to play around with axicam. So I don't know if you've heard about that already, but it's a very specific beam, uh, which is really different compared to Gaussian beams uh, because it is based on interferences. So most of the time it's done with transparent axicam. So you will have actually a kind of lens, but it's conical at the top of it. You, your beam is going through it and it's refocused. And when the beam from the top and the bottom are meeting, they are making interferences. And this is the interferences along the propagation axis, which is making the Bessel beam. This is uh, very interesting to spend an hour just thinking about this beam, how crazy it is and how useful it can be. So uh, it is diffraction free. Why is that? Uh, because it's based on interferences. You are not limited in, in terms of the width of the beam compared to a Gaussian beam, for example. So you are breaking uh, the diffraction law uh, with the Bessel beams. Uh, one very interesting thing also is that they are self, uh, they are um, uh, uh, self uh, heating, so self regenerating. It means that actually the energy which at the end of the Bessel beam is uh, coming from the edges of the hexagon, whereas the energy at the beginning of the Bessel beam is coming from the center of the hexagon. What does that mean? That means if you stop you block the energy inside the center of the beam, you will still have energy at the end of the beam. This is very crazy. So uh, this is uh, extremely useful and it means that one single pulse is actually drilling, or it can be actually drilling uh, over the whole length of the Bessel beam. When you want to do that with transparent axicam, you have drawbacks, uh, mainly due to the, the blend tip. So when you are manufacturing your axicam, uh, the, the tip is actually always a little bit round. And this is actually adding a spherical um, a wave. So you are having your conical wave plus a spherical wave uh, from the, the, the center of the hexagon. And uh, when all this is making interferences, it makes oscillation over the Bessel beam. So you are above the threshold, below the threshold, above the threshold, below the threshold. And this is not good when you're doing cutting. Uh, another big drawback is that glass is heating up. Uh, so the index of the glass is variating. And this is actually not good, again, because you are modifying the pulse duration and the quality of your beam. So we want to do that uh, using a reflective optic. So we have developed a Canon Axican system, which is just a reflective Axican. And we will be uh, doing uh, this uh, experiment with a coherent laser, a Monaco laser, a Eureka scan scanner, and an F-theta lens. Uh, the results are just here. So we were doing some uh, drilling of the LZH and the Kylabs logo. Uh, on a glass which is only uh, 100 micrometer width, it's a shot glass. And uh, what is extremely important to uh, remember from uh, this part of the presentation is that we were processing uh, without a translation, uh, without a translation stage over 50 by 50 millimeter, which is actually huge. It means that our Bessel beam was actually getting through a scanner, and this is very difficult because most of the time when you are using <coughs> Transmissive axicam, it is difficult uh, to have a stable enough beam to get through a scanner. So in our case, it was possible, and we managed for one of the first time uh, of, uh, all over the world to process with a Bessel beam through uh, a scanner. This is the image of what we were doing. So this is a shot glass which is uh, cut, and uh, we were doing what we call single shot drilling. So it means that it's uh, drilling through the whole uh, glass, one shot at each time and only one scan to do uh, the training. I want to make a zoom on that because I don't know if some of you uh, in uh, your uh, experiment uh, may be using or will be using in future uh, uh, axicam and glass cutting. We have developed a unique uh, system which is uh, called the Z-flat. And the idea is that when you are having this is over the propagation, so all along the Bessel beam, uh, generally the intensity profile is just like that. Uh, uh, with this very specific shape. And what we have done is that we have tuned the light so that it's more homogeneous over the propagation. Um, it's actually extremely important because the transition is way sharper. Uh, sharper means that you will be processing your glass until uh, a, a specific thickness, and then it will not process very shortly. Uh, if you have, for example, multiple layer glass, it's extremely useful. The profile is more homogeneous, so the process will be more efficient uh, when you are on in the drilling part, and you have really less wasted energy 
when you are just doing vessel beams, it's it's a big challenge because the beam is very long and the energy is spread over the whole beam. So knowing that you are improving uh, the efficiency of the beam is very important uh, for uh, the processing. We don't have process results for that, so just want to say that this is a very useful tool uh, for glass cutting that uh, maybe it will be uh, used in the future. So microchip uh, welding, uh, we were doing that with Lazea, it's a machine manufacturer based in uh, Belgium, and in that case, uh, we were uh, using also a very standard setup with a scanner and an FTT lens. We were using a laser from amplitude, a femtosecond laser. Uh, in that case, we are doing uh, another kind of, of shaping. So one more time, I would try to explain why they shape. Uh, this is what we call the U shape. So the plateau, uh, the, it's not a topaz shape. It's having less energy in the center. But what is very interesting with that shape is that when you make the calculation, when you are sc scanning, uh, for example, over a line, when you are having this very specific shape, it, it, at the end you have uh, an energy deposition over the, the material which is uh, way more uh, smoother compared to a round of that shape. So this shape is very useful when you want to scan over a line and having a homogeneous energy deposited on your material. So what is a chip, uh, uh, microchip, uh, a microchip uh, that we want to weld? It's a specific part which is very small, uh, like maybe this size with micro channel and where you can do a lot of <clears throat> lab operation for example, you can do PCR tests uh, on the microchips. So now that everybody knows PCR, it's easier to explain what it is. And the idea was to uh, weld the, the channels uh, that uh, are making this op different operation. And you can see that you are doing the welding with a Gaussian beam and with a topaz beam. It's the same scale on those images. So you have less, uh, it's, uh, the quality is improved a lot. It's pretty obvious. The channel is very straight. You have laced uh, um, heat affected zone at the side of the channel. The quality is improved a lot. And the thing is that uh, you were able to do that using uh, way less scanning. So when you are doing a, a weld, you will scan multiple times until it's welded. And in this case, uh, it was uh, using nine times less uh, uh, um, scanning. So the speed and the quality was improved. Now, let me stop my video. Yeah, you can see that uh, the, the liquid, the red liquid, is going uh, inside uh, this uh, microchip of uh, this size, and you have now a coin just there to see what is the size. This is what you have with a Gaussian beam, what you have with a topaz beam, and you see your liquid, which is going uh, through one of the channels uh, of uh, this uh, microchip. Uh, surface texturing, this is a very famous uh, application. Uh, you will hear a lot about it in future because uh, everybody is looking at that. It's very interesting. Uh, you can do a lot of different things. Uh, you can do deep black. So the image that you have on the on the left, actually, it is metal. There is no painting at all, no anodization, nothing. It's just metal. But you have applied a microstructure, which is making it black. It can be very useful, for example, if you want to have something uh, for uh, the army, for example, which cannot be uh, detected or seen. Uh, in the middle, you are doing diffraction. One more time, there is nothing on that except from a microstructure which is doing the diffractive effect. You can do also super hydrophobic uh, system. You have very funny videos of that on the web if you want to have a look. You will drop uh, uh, water um, uh, on uh, the, the part and uh, the water will just jump uh, from it because it's really, really uh, repellent. Uh, why we have a butterfly a beetle and a lotus image is because all those structures that we apply on the metal are uh, very often inspired by nature. So it, it's also something pretty funny about that. There are many ways to do that. You can do spikes, holes, lines, 2D, three dimension of different size. Uh, we don't have time to get into the details, but we have been looking at that also uh, using different shapes. We're again having a very standard uh, setup. Uh, with um, a scanner, uh, laser, femtosecond laser from amplitude and NFT talents. And in that case, we were looking at a line. So why a line? Most of the time when you are doing surface texturing, the big challenge is actually the yield. Uh, you want to go faster and faster. And um, the faster scanner system uh, for now available uh, in the world is a polygon scanner. The drawback of polygon scanner is that they have a very different speed uh, in one direction or the other. So you are scanning very quickly in one direction, but slowly on the other one. 
with this polygon, which is uh, rotating. And in this case, if you are using a line, you will actually uh, compensate for the slow axis, uh, having a longer beam, and uh, you will be scanning very quickly uh, over the width of the line and very slowly over the length of the line. Globally, it makes uh, it's the only way to preserve uh, the quality of the texturing while actually accelerating uh, quite a lot with uh, the polygon scanner. So I will not get into details. We are doing a, a blackening. So this is some samples. We are trying a lot of different parameters to see when we can get actually the deep blackening. We are having different regimes. And the conclusion is that we have improved the yield by a factor of 20. Uh, my last application, thin film removal with Lazia again, so the Belgium company. Uh, again, a pretty similar setup, but a very different uh, shaping. We were doing splitted beams. Uh, why splitted beams? I guess it's pretty obvious. We are looking at the yield improvement. So you want to uh, improve uh, the yield by doing parallel processing. So you will be manufacturing either uh, uh, the same part, but in parallel different uh, areas or different parts. It can be nine parts, for example. What is very challenging is that if you want to have an homogeneous process in between your parts or inside the same uh, process uh, on the same part, you have to have something very homogeneous. So the big challenge was to have the, uh, an homogeneity of less than 2% standard deviation in between the nine uh, split beams. And we were actually having that very good performance over the whole field of view, 40 by 40 millimeters of the FT talents. So we are doing decoating. So decoating is that when you are having a part with multiple uh, coating layers, for example, on a solar panel, and you want to remove uh, just one layer, for example, uh, in order to give some properties to that part. And we were doing uh, the decoding over Mobdilen, actually. And uh, the yield increase was of a factor of nine. So we are now reaching the conclusion of this presentation. I'm quite good on the timing. Um, I, I hope that I've explained to you that there are big challenges, actually, uh, on the beam shaping. And it can be applied to a lot of different applications with a lot of different lasers. I want now to summarize how, uh, when we do the beam shaping, uh, we make our product. We are always focused on three different aspects, and, uh, and all, each of them is very important. We are focused on the shaping quality, and now I hope that you understand that it's not that simple what is a good quality for the shaping. We want to have diffraction limited beam. Pierre, if you don't mind, I have only one minute and I'm gone. I'm, I'm good. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and we want to preserve the depth of field. It's extremely important because uh, uh, if you have a, a, a too small depth of field, your process will not be robust at all, and somehow it will not be industrial. We are focused on the yield improvement because it is a huge challenge of the industry all the time. It can be two ways, or actually many, many ways, but it's uh, mainly having the optimal shaping uh, by having the most, uh, if, the most uh, useful energy inside the beam possible, or by preserving the pulse duration, for example. When we developed our system, uh, one of the biggest challenge is to have something robust and compatible with the industry. So I hope that also I've proved you that uh, the MPFC technology is compatible with a lot of different setup. And a very specific feature that is helping that is the beam stabilization thanks to uh, mod cleaning. So this is how we make our product. And you have seen that uh, it is um, able to provide a lot of different shapes that can be useful for a lot of different processes. And I'm good for uh, the presentation. So I think we have 15 minutes left for the different questions. Uh, just in case so you want to contact me um, later on, uh, you have my email on this slide. So you can send me an email if you have any question in the later days, additionally to the one you will have now.